on how we securitize mortgages for our analysis. We include information on subprime and LK loans. Uh, we don't have anything here on uh, agency backed security or loan problem portfolio. What this means is that our sample is going to be representative of uh, privately securitized subprime and LK loans, and therefore our results can be represented in this population. Not the entire U.S. mortgage market. And just uh, for information, the college data has about 20 million individual loans. Uh, in the okay, so we have both detailed static and dynamic information on these loans. Information from origination in the static file, uh, including property location, uh, data origination, borrower's FICO score, and so on. Going to dynamic data, uh, we have uh, which are updated monthly. We have information on the interest rate, mortgage and balance. Uh, and a low performance status. Now, as I mentioned, we have two supplemental files. One gives us information on the, the terms of modification, for example, uh, whether they received reduction in principal, whether there was principal forbearance, or whether there was a change in the uh, We infer other changes from the uh, dynamic file, for example, uh, reduction in interest rates or changes in we also have this CoreLogic QLTV data. This matches the loans in this data set to public records in order to get information on junior liens for the property and also the value of junior liens. And finally, we also have uh, monthly estimates from CoreLogic's ADM for that particular property. Now, of course, the advantage of this over many previous studies is that rather than taking the appraised amount for the purchase price way back when, which may or may not be an accurate reflection of the home's value, uh, and then just inflating by that by some area, the code or county level HDI, we're actually getting a better approximation of the value of that. All right, so given the size of this data space, we just select 5% of it uh, for our analysis. Uh, we're looking at the period January 2008 through December 2013 specifically. We don't want to look at any loans prior to, uh, originated prior to January 2000 here, uh, and then we're going to focus on modifications occurring after January 2000. Uh, we're also going to to the emerging unemployment rates, just called the economic conditions. This gives us a sample of about 37,000 modified loans. I will say we had a couple, of, more than a few loans that actually got multiple modifications in our sample. They're in here as well. Uh, but, uh, All right, so again, this is just a little bit of our particular sample, the number of modifications. Uh, you see some of the uh, OCC data we had a spike in uh, 2009 and again in 2010, declining thereafter. Uh, here we're just showing for our particular sample the share of loans the payment increase uh, versus the payment decrease. So payment increases are in blue there at the bottom. You see at the earlier periods, I was about a third of loan practice and the go up following the modification. Uh, as you can see, then later on, we had over 8% a reduction in their payment uh, versus less than 20% back in the following modification. And here, uh, looking at uh, changes in the principal balance following modification, early on, we had over 80% of our loans that actually had a principal balance going up as uh, fees and interest were uh, capitalized in the balance. Uh, and that brought to that uh, has declined substantially over time. You see by the end of our sample period, uh, the majority were actually having their balance decrease out of which forbearance, the amortized balance decrease through forbearance reduction. We also saw a lot more uh, weight being decreased out of the next year. Uh, uh, All right, moving on to the And here I just wanted to illustrate the performance of these various modifications uh, over time. Uh, now this is unconditional, so it doesn't control for the economic conditions at the time, but this is a good sense for how these various modifications are performing. So you can see in blue at the bottom there, 2008 modifications uh, within 12 months following modification, uh, nearly 80% have redefaulted, uh, reached 60 plus days or more. And you can think it improved substantially with 2009 months. We've had just over half of still current uh, a year later. Things improved every year. And then finally, by 2013, uh, 12 months post modification, we had 80% were still current. So, big improvement in performance of these loans over time. And then finally, just quickly charting internal outcomes for our loan from the sample. Uh, you see here that REO was by far the most common uh, outcome across the sample period. We did see an uptick in uh, short sales and foreclosure swaps. That, that is, they actually sold the option uh, as opposed to going REO uh, for the end of the sample period. We even saw a slight uptick in chaos for the sample period. 
All right, so in terms of the empirical methods, so we're going to use two different strategies. Your first, uh, just to give uh, a basic analysis, we're going to do a probit and probability of problem on the default. And then we're going to estimate the proportional hazard model and the ability to control for the various states in which we're going to be in various periods. So we're just going to estimate this probit model uh, where uh, the probability of a loan becoming 60 plus days delinquent in 12 months of modification is a function of uh, also loan characteristics and origination. Uh, for example, there was a purchase loan, their ICO store at origination, and so on. Uh, also, a vector of the loan characteristics at the time of the modification. <coughs> Here we're talking about the servicer. I'm not going to speak about that. I'm not allowed to speak about that uh, in the paper or in the analysis in our uh, terms of prologue. I'll just say there is substantial variation across servicers and performance. Uh, there is a look at the payment status of the time of modification, whether there's a due date, modification, and so on. Then finally, the terms of the actual modification, percent of the principal balance is forewarned, uh, percent change in the principal payment, the payment, the interest rate, the principal balance, and also capitalization of fees because and any theater for a modification. In terms of the uh, multinomial logic, uh, we'll get that loan can be current delinquent uh, in foreclosure with REO. Uh, have a short sale be prepaid in any given period, and take this approach to control for that. This also allows us to control for time varying characteristics like the uh, CLPP and also the unemployment rate in the state. And it's going to work really smoothly for you, and it'll look like it's cool. <laughs> so, uh, just in terms of the code uh, analysis for uh, the uh, the characteristics of the loan at uh, origination and modification. Uh, you can see that, uh, so I want to highlight that FICO scores are particularly important. So this is FICO score at origination, so the years and years prior to the modification occurring, whatever cause the need for modification occurring. And still, it's significantly predicted of subsequent loan performance. Uh, and you see here for those 720 and above, relative to 580, 21% reduction in probability of recall within 12 months. Uh, and in terms of uh, other characteristics from origination, uh, from uh, of a loan, whether it's a junior lien, whether it's a purchase loan, whether it's an owner occupied property, those increase the probability of uh, a re default. Also, the status at the time of the modification seems to matter uh, significantly. Those that were 90 plus days delinquent or those in foreclosure were 9% to 12% respectively more likely to be default. And then, of course, as you expect, the house prices go up, the default rates go down, unemployment goes up, the default goes up. All right, in terms of the actual parameters of modification, so at the top here we have principal forbearance of percent of the balance. You can see it's marginally significant, small coefficient estimate. We've got a 1% forbearance of principal result in a 0.04% reduction in the probability of default. Uh, moving next to the principal reduction, you see a much larger effect here, uh, both in significance and magnitude. We've got a 1% reduction in principal resulting in a 0.14% uh, reduction in the probability of default. Uh, so, and then here, uh, capitalization of fees and interest actually significantly increases the probability of subsequent uh, re defaults, uh, reducing the interest rate, reducing the PI. Uh, reduces the probability of the default. Uh, and then um, if you increase the PI, it increases the probability of the default. Make it less affordable, increase the chances of default on the uh, Then finally, again, controlling for the LTV following the modification, you see that uh, relative to, this is relative to less than 80% LTV, but nothing below 100% really uh, differs significantly. Uh, you see increases in probability of default uh, here. Those with LTVs above 150 percent are 5.6 percent more likely to default. Uh, so, based on this 100 percent threshold, this makes a significant difference in this model. All right, so the multinomial logic results, I'm just going to present them as figures for uh, ease um, of comparison. Here, looking at 50 day delinquent, the status of being 50 days delinquent. We see that basically any improvement to the terms of the loan through modification reduces the probability of being in default. Uh, conversely, if you worsen the terms of the loan, it increases the probability of that people re default. Uh, so here you see we get about a third of a percent reduction for every 1% of, of these balance that's forewarned. 
uh, basically a one-to-one -one ratio for uh, principal reduction in terms of uh, reduction in subsequent delinquency. Uh, similarly, a 1% increase in uh, capital, the second balance was capitalized with even interest, uh, increased the probability of being in default, uh, again, reductions for uh, reductions in interest rate and PI, and then a slight increase or even increase. Uh, in terms of entering the foreclosure process, again, a uh, small effect of forbearance there, about 0.3% or 1% uh, principal for warrant. Relatively one and a half percent reduction in uh, entering foreclosure uh, for one percent reduction in principal. Again, we see this uh, basically one to one ratio for the capitalization of the interest. Uh, these reductions in interest rates and PI, uh, reducing the probability of subsequent foreclosure. Uh, and then also, we see a marginal effect from the increase in the PI. Uh, finally, in terms of REO and foreclosure sale, but from our, for our analysis, we combine both REOs and foreclosure sale because the borrower's perspective, they've lost their home, those cell phones are equivalent. Uh, and so uh, here you can see again, uh, we actually have 1% uh, principal forbearance, reducing uh, probability of entering uh, REO by about 1.3%, similar estimate for the principal reduction, uh, not being really significant on the uh, on the uh, worsening of the terms, and the big one here, this 1.68% uh, reduction in uh, REOs and 1% reduction in PNI. And this is just for short payoffs, again, it's a similar pattern as we've seen in most of the slides. All right, so I'm just putting this up to illustrate uh, how significant the effect of LTV is post monetization on subsequent loan performance. So this is all relative to an LTV of less than 80%. And you can see that as LTV post modification increases, the probability of some adverse outcome increases substantially, such that by an LTV of greater than 150%, we actually have a 900% increase in the probability of the loan and in REO before you said. Uh, we have a 200% increase in probability of interest foreclosure. Uh, you can see also an 80% increase in probability of being delinquent and so on. This, again, uh, pretty big for REO, significantly higher uh, as the LP increases. And then finally, I just wanted to emphasize again that this FICO score of origination, even years later, is a significant predictor of subsequent uh, adverse outcomes. Those at the higher end of the FICO uh, score range, 720 and above, relative to those below 580, much less likely to be 60 plus days delinquent, uh, much less likely to be in foreclosure, and then in REO, we see defines as the FICO score defines. So, just briefly to conclude, uh, from our analysis, it looks like if you improve the terms of the loan, if you make it more affordable, uh, you reduce redefault and foreclosure. Not a particularly surprising finding. Uh, conversely, if you make things worse, people are more likely to redefault and foreclosure. Uh, it looks like forbearance does have uh, some effect on delinquency and foreclosure, but relative to magnitude of the principal reductions, uh, the effects are relatively small on most estimates. Now, the capitalization of fees and interest significantly increases redefault and foreclosure risk. Uh, also, just emphasizing again that the LPB makes a huge difference in subsequent loan performance. And also the FICO score uh, being appreciated for important discussion performance. And finally, just that the delinquency status at the time of modification uh, is also highly predictive. So it matters when the loan is modified. So in terms of some implications, uh, now in general, it looks like principal reductions are pretty effective. Uh, they operate not just through what we would be estimate we get on principal reduction coefficient, also for the fact that they affect the PNI, they also affect the LTP. So overall large effect. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're the most cost effective, the most beneficial for investor, lender, uh, given that, you know, relative to the uh, reduced risk of default, the foreclosure and so on, is this uh, higher cost um, worthwhile. And so uh, further analysis is certainly needed there uh, to determine which of these is the most cost effective of that modification and that turn over to test cost a little bit of a way to um, so I, I want to um, thank Max for for laying out the, the, the landscape of um, uh, so that I can go to um, 
So uh, I am, this is a paper that I um, that I co authored with um, and it, uh, we are using the PCRA program um, to, as a lens through which to look at uh, experimental variation of and its uh, impact on. Uh, I will uh, say that I would not be research for So our research question is um, by how much the reducing amount of equity through uh, the principal balance will uh, reduce substance more achievable. Um, we use data uh, from the, oh, uh, we use data from the um, from the HAMP PRA program, um, which is a uh, government sponsored program to um, to help delivery for for uh, involved borrowers. Um, and we use a uh, quasi-experimental uh, method called the regression case design um, to identify effects of variation in principal variation, raising um, other hand theory uh, on the um, So in this context, default is defined as um, program exit, which happens at uh, 90 days of um, in the program principal, uh, so we average about 28% of the um, of the the unbalanced loan um, at modification. Uh, in in the sample, uh, the these principal forgiveness, we saw a quarter default hazard of 3.1%, um, and we found that without uh, principal forgiveness, we would have seen a uh, counterfactual uh, default rate of about 3.8%. And you know, with a pretty healthy um, confidence that are in that. Um, so, why might negative equity uh, matter for the ball? Um, negative equity effectively means um, that you are paying a price that is sort of ex post to mod for, for the property that you have purchased. Um, if, if negative equity has arisen through, um, through home price um, So, so the fact that one is paying uh, sort of a, uh, a a realized value that's too high may make borrower pay, you know reluctant to actually uh, to actually repay it, kind of put the property back. Um, it also makes borrowers vulnerable to economic shock. So if if something happens, unemployment, health crisis, you know something like that, um, borrowers may not be able to sell their home and be able to satisfy the the outstanding balance of their work. Um, so, so what principal does, forgiveness does, is um, sort of conditional on on the cost associated with the mortgage. It uh, it reduces the, the the present benefit of sort of not right, the future benefit of not default. Uh, so, uh, HAMP is a government program to help uh, delinquent borrowers. Um, it participation is not only voluntary for services and lenders, but conditional on participation, services and lenders were required to follow a very stringent set of rules. Um, they were required to treat borrowers um, equivalently based on sort of auditable, observable characteristics. Um, the delinquent borrowers are are sent a letter about camp and uh, qualified borrowers apply. Um, and standard camp. Uh, the sort of the first incarnation of the program reduced everybody's um, mortgage to 31% of their gross income. Um, so this included the principal and the payment and the tax of the um, And it did this through a series of uh, what we call modi uh, modification waterfall, um, in which first the interest rate was reduced and then the term was extended and then forbearance was used as necessary to, to achieve the 31% uh, payment charge. Um, the the rate the rate reduction um, if if it fell below sort of current market rate um, phased out after after five years and um, rates be, uh, begin to step up. Um, there was a, a net present value test to um, to measure the sort of economic um, viability of the mortgage modification um, and the borrower completes a three month trial. Um, so uh, so everybody who sort of shows up and gets that. Completed a few months ago. We are looking at the camp It shares a lot of features with the senior camp program, um, but uh, but 
but rather than using interest rate reduction as a first step of the waterfall, it uses LTV reduction. So, um, so first the uh, lender will um, reduce the mortgage down and either to the amount that's the first issue, the GI target, or the amount necessary to issue the LTV target, whichever requires less than more. Um, and uh, services could, could set their own target. In, this, in our sample, these are sort of two, uh, two global kind of uh, choices. Um, one was 115% LTV, and one was 100% LTV, and the, the services used 100% LTV uh, capped their, capped their uh, LTV target at 30% of um, the original. Um, so, so applicants can be in, uh, offered either standard or HAMP, uh, or PRA under the HAMP program, and um, this decision is determined typically by an, an NPD test. So, servicers can use different rules, but, um, but in practice, there was a uh, there was you know an NPD test that um, that sort of identified the higher value points. Um, again, there was a three month trial, uh, and the program. Was so this is uh, um, this illustrates the, the waterfall, um, and so you, you, know, you can just see that the hand uh, start with the point, and then it moves to the rest of the different waterfall. So it's insufficient, the payment, right, principal forgiveness is insufficient to reach the LTV target. Um, rate, the rate of interest determines the spending. And this was for more until the DGI chart. So we use uh, the administrative records for all permanent uh, camp modifications that were enrolled in the program uh, from January 2011, so after the first cohort had to uh, finish their, their trial period. Uh, and we observed them through, so enrollment occurred through June 2013. We observed uh, loans through uh, September 2013. Um, we, we wound up a sample of 45,513 loans, um, which, which translates into probably 244,000 loan quarters. Um, the, the first cohort, we tracked 14 quarters. Um, and again, the outcome variable of index is 90 delinquency. Um, at that point, borrowers are disqualified from the program. We use that. So we can't actually use the other one. So, uh, and we, we measure that in the quarter of the cabinet. So we take new defaults, new 90 delinquency that are share of loans that are remaining in the program at that date. Um, and every loan in the program is due to the month's outcome. So, um, we, so we're using a regression to design. Um, I am going to present the formula, and then I'm going to present a picture that is going to help. This is, uh, so we, we calculate the, uh, we calculate the actual principal forgiveness amount using a main function. Um, which I which I describe in, in words, but it is the minimum amount necessary to reach the DPI target and the LTV target. And we can control separately for, for the principal forgiveness amount implied by the DPI target and the principal forgiveness amount uh, implied by the LTV target. And we do that because um, we, there may be selection into sort of pre-modification characteristics. So if you have a, a very high LTV, for example, or a very high CPI, you may have a baseline default rate that is different um, than somebody who with a lower with a lower LTV um, who may be less default rate. So so by controlling separately for the the, uh, the characteristics that determine the policy, um, we, we can sort of infer the effects of the policy. Um, so this is what our change looks like in, um, in sort of in practice. So on the vertical axis, we have the final LTV. On the horizontal axis, we have the initial LTV. 
when you're changing, um, we are going to think about a set of blocks that all have the same CGI. So they have a CGI such that at the historical point, um, the amount of forgiveness to buy by their loan value ratio is equal to the amount provided by their uh, debt to income ratio. So to the left of this point, lower, uh, borrowers have lower LTV. Um, and uh, they, the, um, they wind up with uh, sort of the same final LTV. Sorry, the same final LTV. To the right of the line, borrowers have higher <clears throat> higher initial LTV rates, and their LTV, uh, their final LTV is increasing in their initial LTV. So the reason that I want to think about one borrower is because it illustrates the, the problem with um, regression to mind in general, which is that it's difficult to distinguish sort of any kind of any underlying structural relationship between the things that determine, the inputs that determine the policy treatment um, and the effect of the policy treatment. <laughs> okay. um, so now um, I'm going to move to a second borrower who has a higher EGI. And with this you can, um, you can see that, sort of, that uh, sort of a broader spectrum of borrowers have LTVs along the point that, uh, that gives them sort of the same final uh, the same kind of LTV. So, so as we think about sort of sweeping across the the um, the the uh, DTI, sorry, the initial LTV range um, with with borrowers with different DTIs, we can see that this this creates basically a three dimensional case. Um, so that so that borrowers with different uh, initial LTVs and DTIs have changed in different ways. and this allows us to control non-parametrically. For um, for both LTV and DTI, huh. by non parametrically I mean like very quickly. So we're not relying on like a specific sort of relationship between uh, between the the, uh, the input variables and the output. So this is our econometric census. Um, the first so beta PF identifies the slope change as K. So this identifies the effects of principal for um, The yeah, the two the beta LTV and beta DTI um, control for the for the initial and final DTI and the initial and final uh, LTV. Um, and X is a is a series of control variables um, and dominates whether or not you have a 115 or 100 percent uh, LTV target and um, a, a number of borrower characteristics. Um, So our our method for determining the amount of principal forgiveness relies on us being able to predict to uh, predict services behavior very well. And we do um, we have an R squared of about 0.99 percent. So we are able to um, we're able to predict sort of what services actually do with borrowers very well. Um, and so the case design um, makes it difficult to argue that the amount of principal forgiveness is correlated with unobservables. Um, uh, because servicers, both because this, um, the, the kink is determined by things that we can see, um, in with the LTV and DTI, but also because servicers um, are required to treat borrowers um, and, and their policies have to be auditable. So, um, so they have to sort of treat borrowers based on, on their observable characteristics. Um, and, uh, and the one dimension of selection that um, that we really uh, can't control for, I won't say the one dimension, but <laughs> I'm a little bit, but, um, but the, one, the one thing we really can't uh, control for is whether or not borrowers respond to different amounts of principal forgiveness in their modification. And that would be concerning it to sort of borrow with different, uh, different kind of baseline default rates except the modification at a different rate. Um, so this is our uh, this is the result. Uh, this is a um, this is a log specification, um, and it is a quarterly hazard. And rather than uh, as, sort of, as we go um, left to right, uh, the only thing I want to take away from this uh, very crowded table is that as we go from um, 
the left to the right, right we're, we're increase, uh, increasing the flexibility of the specification and we're adding more control variables, um, including sort of the, the full set of characteristics that servicers use to grant, uh, to determine whether or not a borrower is used um, is uh, the PRA modification and you know, how much. Um, and and uh, the, the coefficient is, is pretty stable, as we do from last year. So our allotment coefficient um, varies from minus 0 0.54 to minus 0 0.87. Um, we again see a, a hazard rate of 3.1%. Um, this, this coefficient implies that about uh, a 10% um, in uh, reduction in principal um, means about 0.2 to 0.3 uh, percentage points got by the part of the hazard rate. Um, and the sort of counterfactual, so with zero principal uh, forgiveness, we, we, would, um, we would expect to see the default rate of about 3.8%. And uh, this is a uh, graphic showing the cumulative default rate. So on the right hand side, um, we have loans that were uh, originated basically the quarter before we started observing them. And um, on the left hand side, we have the, the first cohort of loans. So we can track that left hand cohort uh, for 10 quarters. Um, and we see about a 10 percentage point change in, uh, in the cumulative default rate. Um, so this, uh, this illustrates the change in the default rate around thinking. So um, on to the left hand, uh, on the left hand side of the vertical bar here are um, are are the, the set of loans um, who, that all have the same final LTV. Right. So these are the loans that that receive uh, for which LTV is binding. They move on to other steps uh, of the waterfall, so they get the, the full payment. Uh, on the, on the, sorry, I think I said that exactly backwards. <laughs> uh, BPI is binding. They, um, they, uh, and uh, is that a right <laughs> um, The uh, LTV is binding, and and they all have the the, the same final default rate. On the right hand side, uh, their their final LTV is increasing. In their initial LTV. Um, so, so this sort of changes. Um, you, you can see that uh, the default rate as, as the final LTV is changing and as, uh, as the increasing LTV uh, it no longer translates to principal forgiveness, uh, the, the default rate rises. Um, so, uh, we, we, we have, I'm showing an exercise here where we sort of zoom in on the ink. Um, so just to make sure that, it, that our results aren't being driven by sort of outliers or in a structural thing, um, we, we try to get as close to the king as we can. And we don't have enough power to get a very close in, but, um, but our, our coefficient does stay fairly stable as we can. Uh, and uh, we also did a series of placebo tests. So this is to, um, we use uh, either sort of alternate key points or uh, samples that, that did not receive principal forgiveness in order to see whether um, their outcome shows a, a change in uh, default procedure at the same time as, um, as borrowers that did receive, uh, receive principal forgiveness. So if, if we see, uh, Placebo samples having a key in place, um, we, we would think that we were sort of uncovering something uh, funky and structural in, in the data. And so I'm just going to illustrate um, this is the same graph um, where we have included GSD mortgages. So these are mortgages that uh, did not receive the treatment. Um, and as you can see, they have no change in behavior um, at, the, at the point where the treated, the, the treated uh, loans do. Um, um, so, in, I, I wanted to just talk through a very simple way of thinking about cost and benefits of principal forgiveness. Um, so, the, the cost to granting principal forgiveness to a loan that would have defaulted with certainty without principal forgiveness is zero. There is there is no way that you're recovering that money. So, 
So as you sort of uh, decrease the counterfactual default rate, so as you decrease the, the um, sort of probability that the loan that received forgiveness would have defaulted absent forgiveness, you increase the cost of forgiveness. Um, so, so in the context of our paper, um, we can think of again a very simplified sort of cost of forgiveness as the amount of personal forgiveness plus 30 percent, you know, take down, and one minus the lifetime redefault rate. So in this example, that would be like roughly the 10, um, the 10 quarter default rate. Um, the benefit of principal forgiveness is the change in the redefault rate times the difference between what you what you uh, receive in in recovery, so if the loan goes to foreclosure, um, and what you receive with the modified one. Um, so the cost effectiveness of principal forgiveness is increasing, sort of will increase if the default reducing benefits of principal forgiveness uh, grow or narrow over time. So for example, um, in in the HAMP sample, um, the loans that didn't some of the loans that didn't receive principal forgiveness will see rate step ups. Um, we may we may assess the benefits of principal forgiveness differently. Um, if for example, more loans of particular um, defaults uh, at a particularly high rate relative to loans. Um, and the cost effectiveness of principal forgiveness will increase if the counterfactual default rate increases or decreases. So, if, um, you know, if it turns out that loans that didn't receive principal forgiveness um, end up, uh, you know, and then ultimately decreasing the high default rate. So in, in our sample, and, uh, just in the first cohort, um, the, the changes in default rate apply is why about an eight hundred and seventy seven thousand dollar uh, write down for foreclosure avoidance. I want to be clear that that's not the cost of foreclosure avoidance uh, for, sorry, foreclosure avoidance, because it doesn't include um, the it, it doesn't include the, the counterfactual default. That's just the key um, the, the total right now for the change of the um, but it implies that about ten loans are written down for every appointed foreclosure. Um, and it implies the government subsidy or about two hundred and sixty two thousand dollars per way. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that the structure of this problem uh, means that we are comparing principal forgiveness to rate reduction, which is also kind of simple. Um, because rate reduction also comes from value to borrow. So, you know, there's no kind of research assessing how important the difference between like, rate reduction and other forms of principal uh, payment reduction are, but it's possible that that matters. My turn to the event for the book. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming out. I want to thank Lori for inviting me. Uh, Okay, there we go. We got it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm excited to, to talk about these two papers. I think uh, both of the authors are, are extremely careful um, and extremely modest about what, what they've just shown you. And I, so I think I want to try to draw out some of the big, uh, some of the big highlights. Um, coming from an academic background, I'm going to give you all some homework, uh, some additional reading to do. I do want to really encourage you to read uh, both of these papers today, but also there, there's a, a really nice theory paper that sort of delves into some of these topics as well that I think um, it really informs the conversation if we, if we talk about that a bit uh, uh, in addition. So I think you know, these are two really tremendous data efforts 
Both papers are, are marshalling unprecedented data and trying to answer these questions about the impact of a principal reduction. I think when we're talking about principal reduction or mortgage modification more generally, we want to take a step back and think a little bit more about the broader goals here. I think uh, at the end of the day, the main goal is to really help struggling homeowners continue to pay right? And so that may be, you know, that may be through avoiding foreclosure and keeping those people in those same homes, but there may be other ways in which we could help folks as well. And I think, you know, it is a controversial statement to say that these aren't actually homeowners, right? These are people who own 2% of their house, or they own 10% of their house, or maybe they own 20% of their house. And now they're underwater, they owe, you know, they owe more than the house is worth, so they never own the house out, right? Beforehand. And the question is, you know, how important is it that we keep those people in that exact same house? And based on some of these estimates, the question then is, is it, you know, is it worth $877,000 to keep that person in the same house, in the same type of, of mortgage arrangement? And one of the tools is certainly to, to try to avoid foreclosure by securing uh, delinquent borrowers. And I think we have a, a sense in which there are sort of larger issues at play when we keep people in their homes, they avoid uh, the really painful frictions of moving taking their kids to a new school district, so on and so forth, as well as the neighborhood. And really uh, nice and concrete evidence of the neighborhood level fillovers of foreclosure used to related to blight when we think about the cost to you know, the entire community or entire neighborhood. We keep those in mind as well when we think about the cost as benefit. But one of the challenges that we face when we're studying this issue is that these are data sets of mortgages, right? And so we don't actually see the people behind those mortgages. And when we're thinking about why homeowners default, well, we're mostly looking at people who have defaulted in the first place, and we're now thinking about a redefault. So these are people who have already gone through a default episode of missing mortgage payments. Uh, uh, why might that have happened? Well, the most likely reason is probably some shock to their liquidity. So some income shock, medical shock, something along those lines, of death in the family. And these are exactly the things that are not observed in, in these types uh, of data sets. Uh, Homeowners might be, be defaulting because of contract-related shocks, or payment shocks when a rate resets or a teaser period ends, or just bad underwriting in the first place. So someone who can't make the very first month uh, on a mortgage contract, that was probably not a, a good loan to have written in the first place. Uh, there may be also strategic uh, incentives to walk away uh, from a house, and that isn't really especially addressed in this paper, I think, just to highlight one of your uh, one of your assignments for, for later, your additional reading. Uh, Jane Doko, who's here, has a really nice paper with, uh, with Neil Dukov and Ray Sean on, on sort of the extreme depths with which a household needs to be in negative equity before we see a lot of, of walk away behavior. Um, all right, I'm going to try to get a bit quicker. So we're thinking about the key research questions here. I think, you know, the first question that, that these papers are trying to address is how do we help homeowners uh, to stop this transition from a redefault to a, to a foreclosure? And I think, you know, these papers are really unpacking the mechanisms of this black box where servicers were sort of throwing out offers willy-nilly uh, early on in this period. Uh, then things were much more standardized through the HAMP program and the additional HAMP PRA program. And these papers are really doing a concrete uh, evaluation of, of those modification efforts. Are these modifications cost-effective? Uh, well, it depends on how we estimate the benefits, right? How are we measuring the neighborhood level benefits that, that these types of, of Calculations can't possibly capture because we need neighborhood level data on, on house prices and we need to measure the spillover impact. Uh, but it really seems to depend importantly on which features are you know, thinking about the cost of a principal reduction. These types of programs offer very different uh, government subsidies or government incentives from, say, a rate reduction versus a, a principal reduction, whereas in, in some ways, Pat mentioned this, those have a similar impact in both the sort of short term and long term benefits. So we need to think really carefully about which features of, of modifications are, are cost effective. Uh, and then a broader, bigger question is, are principal reductions the, the solution if a temporary income disruption is, is the problem? Right? So a, a principal reduction is really something about forward-looking wealth uh, of the household. It's something about that's very long-term and it's changing, uh, in many ways, this choice of whether to walk away and how the homeowner is going to think about being underwater. Right? Most homeowners aren't marking their house to market every day and saying, oh boy, I'm 3% underwater today or I'm 7% underwater today. It matters when they actually go and they try to sell a house. So some people are extremely forward looking and they might value the asset uh, in a very sort of fully, uh, fully forward looking way. But a lot of people don't need to think about the like, actual value of their house until they're planning. And so a principal reduction is going to affect the long-term benefit 
but it may have a much less, much lesser effect of a program that's designed to really address the problem at hand, which is a more temporary income study. Now, it sort of does that indirectly by reducing the, the, the payments, but, uh, but it might not be the exact way. Really. Okay, so, so to, talk, to talk just a little, little bit about Max's paper in, in, in more detail, there's really great data on subprime and all-pay loans from, from CoreLogic, and I think one of the really striking takeaways from this paper is, is just how many of the modifications were increasing the payments. Uh, early in the period. So in 2008, at the depth of the crisis, over a third of mortgage modifications were increasing the payment. Think about how crazy that is. You call your servicer up and you say, hey, my payments are too high, I can't make them. And the service says, servicer says, hey, that's great, I'm going to raise your payment. Like, that can't possibly be the right solution. So if the one thing this paper does is to, to convince people that that type of a modification is, is a, a pool of errand in those types of settings, and this is a huge value added, I think, to, to the policy discussion. The paper uses the hazard model approach to estimate the impact of, of modifications on, on redefault, and I think, uh, you know, Max undersells this a little bit, but you do see the types of features of the contract you would expect uh, to reduce uh, delinquency that does, in fact, reduce delinquency. If you help people by making, making them uh, required to make smaller payments, they're more likely to make those payments. I think that's great. Uh, intuitive and obvious. I think one of the challenges with, with Max's approach is thinking about how the initial conditions relate to the terms of the modification. So the people who are in a particularly bad spot with a high LTV or a high DTI, in some cases get a more generous modification, in other cases they might not get a modification at all because it's NPD negative. So we want to think pretty carefully about the selection into getting a modification and then thinking about the selection conditional on getting a modification sort of endogeneity of the, of the terms and conditions. I think that's on the next slide, if I can uh, get it to go there. Uh, so the size of the elements of the modification itself are endogenous to the pre-modification characteristics of the borrower and the housing market. And so if we worry, so one example of this is this, you know, initial LTV or LTV at the time of modification is a big predictor of subsequent default. So how does a person get into a high LTV situation in the first place? Well, they're probably in a neighborhood where house prices have fell dramatically, they may also have extracted equity. They may, in, to sort of address other short-term liquidity problems, they may put very little money down up front, sort of suggestive of not having a lot of a buffer uh, to weather other financial shocks. And so there are other things beyond just the characteristics of the modification that affect the subsequent outcomes, but rather the characteristics of the borrower that affects what type of modification they get. And I think that's one of the, the really neat things about, about Tessa's paper is sort of uh, to transition to, to that. That paper is, uh, is it's really trying to get around this issue by highlighting a, a, a setting in which the, the characteristics vary independent of, of the borrower characteristics, the modification characteristics vary independently. And, and it's, it's a bit involved to understand exactly what's going on in the paper. There's, a, there's this neat three-dimensional picture in the paper that then tries to get collapsed down to two dimensions. But even messier than, than what Tess showed you today, I think there's a really deep intuition behind it, which is uh, that as you sort of vary around the case, some borrowers are hitting the DTI limit first, and other borrowers are hitting the LTV limit first, and that's going to change how generous the principal forgiveness is uh, around that kink. And because consumers are strategically locating on either side of the kink, we can think of it as a very exogenous type, uh, type of treatment. The average loan was receiving over a 25% principal reduction through, through this program. Uh, I think there are some important assumptions that underlie a regression kink design. Uh, certainly, that there are similar borrowers around the kink, but even as you get further away from the kink, because you're estimating slopes uh, and the sort of the parametric design of those slopes matter, matters quite a bit. But I think the, the placebo test is really uh, kind of the, the thing that knocks this paper out of the park for me. Um, and I'm going to show it in just a second. But the test really varies the lead when she gets the cost estimate. And again, it's not exactly cost, um, but $877,000. Dollars per, per foreclosure uh, avoided, and the cost of the government is $262,000 per foreclosure avoided. And so, you know, a challenge to people in this room is to think of other things you could have done to keep people in their homes for $262,000. I think there are a lot of ways in which uh, you could have designed other programs, you could have bought people's houses outright uh, for, for that type of money. So, here's the placebo figure again, uh, and the, the squares show, show the version. Uh, uh, in the absence of this program, sort of what the falls look like, and then the blue, the two blue fitted lines show the impact of the program. So you see, basically on the right side, the, the, the two lines are essentially the same, and on the left side is where you see a big difference 
in the treatment. And so they've done a really nice job kind of isolating exactly the features uh, of the program that were affecting uh, read quality. I think these papers are bringing us towards the consensus view that the larger the payment reduction, the fewer default. Uh, and this is, again, it's almost true by construction, but I think what we need is a better understanding of why people default in order to target modifications and modifications more, uh, more precisely. Uh, just to take one example, if people are liquidity constrained and reducing the principal with no change in the payment, uh, shouldn't matter at all on the market. Right? If you can't make this month's payment, it doesn't matter if that right down the side of the mortgage if you're not changing, uh, changing the payment. And I think, well, again, what we're missing is sort of what I'm calling the holy grail of data, which is debt, assets, income, and consumption. We'd really like to know more about the income uh, of these borrowers so we can know something about income shocks and understand how those income shocks are translating into payment hardship. Uh, and we might be able to design better temporary assistance programs, which might not affect the mortgage at all, but could affect income through other types of transfers. And we really like to know more about consumption, right? The, the main goal here is to maintain consumption through a recession, thinking about the issues related to debt overhang and other kinds of constraints. But if we knew more about, about consumption, we could see whether these programs actually had their intended effect outside of the mortgage contract alone, right? These papers are concluding something about avoided foreclosures, but this help had to have helped households on the margin who are reducing their payments, even if they're not avoiding foreclosure. They're using the money they were paying their mortgage off, off on to on the groceries or to pay for car repairs. Uh, there are other consumptive benefits that we're just not observing through uh, through the limits of uh, of this data. Uh, and I see John Stable House nodding his head to the SDF will, will help us to get us a bit more uh, going forward. Uh, all right, so just very quickly on the theory side. So here's your assignment. So there's a paper by uh, Jan Everly and Arvind Christian Murphy in uh, the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity from last year. And it's a really nice model. Uh, it's a theory paper, but, but don't let that scare you. Uh, it's really worth the trouble to think carefully about uh, how we should think about prioritizing uh, these types of uh, credit policies when we're in the midst of a crisis that's related to, to a housing crash. And what they really highlight is that while principal reductions can, can help deal with the strategic default motive, they're very costly and they spread benefits over a much longer time horizon than a short-term income structure. And so it's certainly the case that during the Great Recession, people's incomes were disrupted more than, than usual. We saw a lot more long-term unemployment than normal, but even that is far shorter than the usual mortgage, uh, mortgage duration. And so there's a much larger role in their model for the sort of most effective uh, tools uh, to lower the monthly payment through uh, forbearance, uh, which sort of gets a little bit of short shrift in the, in the work uh, that the two authors presented today, but I think could be studied in, in more detail, especially the design of the forbearance, whether the balloon payment is due, uh, when the balloon payment is due, and how the, the contract is being structured. Uh, reducing interest rates and extending mortgage terms, and this paper concludes that what you want to really focus on is allowing for disproportionately lower payments when the borrowing constraint binds. So when households are strapped, this is exactly when you really need to sharply reduce their monthly payments. Uh, and uh, a forbearance program along those lines uh, might be one way to do it. And they actually look at their sort of policy discussion at the end, come around to a program that looks a bit more like the HARP program. So just to conclude, I can get to that concluding slide. I think there's really two great examples of careful and thorough work with big data to answer a super important policy question. This is, again, a market where $5 trillion of equity was, uh, went out the window, and we really need to understand better what impact that has uh, on households. I think we're using these types of research efforts to build a consensus around uh, the view that, that principal forgiveness receives limited bang for the buck, but that uh, modifications more generally reduce uh, defaults the more generous that they were. I think we, we should think carefully through some of the alternatives that we might want to avoid uh, avoid the same problem going forward. One would be a large scale forbearance uh, or a refinancing program. Uh, automatic refinancing contracts have been discussed when uh, when a, a recession hits. Uh, there may be an option built into the contract so that the loan automatically refinances, so there's no effort necessary on the part of borrowers who may be incentive. Uh, and then letting some homeowners fail in a low cost way, like transitioning from home to rent. Again, we need to think carefully about whether uh, what it means to call these people homeowners when they didn't actually own a, a very large state uh, in the home. And just one final note is that, uh, you know, these mortgage programs missed uh, a lot of people, and a lot of those folks have been immediate 
household. So not just the renters who were sort of affected by the investors who own the property, um, but also the folks who were MPV negative through these types of waterfall efforts, or the people who failed uh, to reach a permanent modification because they couldn't complete the trial modification. So we're missing a pretty important slice uh, of the population when we're thinking about uh, the impact of simple kids programs well. So I'd like to thank all three presenters for great, fabulous presentations. Thank, thank you very much. Um, if you have a question um, in the room, just um, raise your hand and we'll provide you with a mic. For those on the web, um, you know, just, please just um, email in your questions to events at urban.org. So I see a question in the back. Hi. Well, here we go. Uh, Bernie Marstein, uh, economic consultant, the advisors. Uh, for Max, is there any difference in either tax treatment, regulation, et cetera, on the different modifications for lenders? In other words, from the lender's perspective, is, is a lender any different among these different choices, or does it make a difference in terms of the balance sheet, taxes, regulations, et cetera? Unfortunately, I don't know offhand what the different implications of the modifications are. I assume there's some aspect of different modifications with having to recognize losses currently as opposed to at some point. But, uh, I'm not sure if there's somebody else in the room who has a better sense for it. And I guess I wonder, 
But did you look at factors like um, the housing type environment? So surely you would imagine that physical reduction would matter more depending on the circumstances in which the borrower finds itself. So if they're in a market that looks like it's going to going down forever, that could be a very different context than the borrower looks in the market that seems to be turning around. So it seems like you have some data to exploit to look at that a little bit. I wonder if you've done it and just not talk to us about it here or if it's something you have planned to do. And I guess secondarily, did you look at any groups of them? So again, going to Ben for the rest of that, there are a lot of trades that wind up. There are a collection of issues here in terms of who's offered what sorts of modifications. And that may go in part to the type of loans people have in the first place. I wonder if you explored any of those issues. So I can say um, in this work, I hadn't actually been told by the trend in house prices or any expectations for house prices. Uh, I will say in, in other work, uh, I, I looked at, I think, over house price trends, house prices uh, change, and borrowers are really easy to respond to that. Um, so, but not in this context of this particular uh, research. Whether there was heterogeneity in their thoughts, but in terms of that, so one of the things I was hoping, at least in terms of identification early on, was that it really did seem that the servicer had no idea what they were doing, was giving up modifications that very dependent the borrower characteristics. Now, I think that changed substantially, closed down, most of my account periods closed down, so the events of prison is exactly valid. Uh, which is why we need better do that. Um, but um, I was coming on that at least for the earlier period, the flight education. But I guess every right when say that services have a very specific policy of modifying. So I, I did work uh, looking at the, the criteria since modification and before modification. Um, and what I found was that in my sample period, um, there Basically, wasn't enough variation in prices to have the power to uh, be able to sort of see any any difference. Uh, but I mentioned that over the long run, as as the price uh, patterns become a little bit more dispersed, uh, I guess there's that. Question: What's your opinion on that? I'm Jim DeVille. I'm a studio housing specialist. I've been on the handful of site since day one. I'm a robot. 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 So I'm really surprised as to what the author of the book is doing. The author of the book is the introduction to the channel. That's $165,000. I'm just blowing it away. It's much, much higher than what Treasury reports to us and the public. Uh, much higher than even that 28% of UPB is about $80,000 at the most. Right? On average, how could you come up with this? Um, so, that number is not, not at all comparable to the, to the total cost of the camp modification or um, there. There's an alternate estimate. Uh, so, wrote a, uh, a paper in which he estimated that the cost for professional and the end of the program is about $200. I mean, I can So, this is the marginal. So, everybody gets the write down of 30 to 31. Right, everybody gets a, a standard production to 31%, and that avoids a lot of foreclosures. And what I'm looking at is the marginal effect of, of writing down the principle. So, conditional on sort of getting this. This modification that dramatically reduces your your uh, foreclosure rate. It turns out that adding um is is expensive when looked at sort of in, uh, compared to the standard. But I thought it was too early. So what so what you're looking at is so it's true that reducing principal uh, reduces both your unpaid balance and your payment, 
but the, the comparison is a borrower who has received that payment through basically a, a cheaper um, this reduction. Yes. Um, and so, and again, this is this is the, the um, when you're looking at the subsidy rate, uh, the government has has subsidized the different uh, payment approach, like the payment redu reduction approaches differently. Um, so the principal forgiveness component was was heavily subsidized, um, whereas uh, the the payment reduction component was was less less subsidized. But I'm still confused. I know that shows up on the monthly. Performance reports, so, you know, seventy-eight thousand to eighty thousand per PRA. You now, is that the amount of the actual reduction? Is that so, so if you don't know where it is, yeah, yeah, no. So, if you want to, if you want to convert into the numbers that, that I just showed, so, so that's right. You have about eight hundred thousand um, dollars per per PRA, and you get about ten foreclosures avoided. Right. So that means then uh, it's about 800, you know, thousand plus per foreclosure avoided. Um, and, uh, but the subsidy that the government paid for that is on average about 45 cents on the dollar. I think it's actually a little bit lower than that um, on the dollar. So, so you end up with uh, um, Oh, let me ask you, let me ask you, ask a follow-up question to to Jim. Um, and that is, um, the investor has a cost, whether it's a principal reduction or whether it's an interest, whether you um, reduce the interest rate. When you were doing your calculations, did you assume, did you take into account the fact that um, when you when you're doing your cost calculations, did you give any credit to the, for the um, that the lower interest rate um, actually is taking care of costs as well. So, you know, this is the marginal. Uh, so, okay. so, to be clear, the ten rate number, which is for the for the standard camp program, is just the government cost. Okay. Um, and uh, and the eight hundred seventy seven thousand that was the eight seventy seven. Yeah, it's just the um, is is just the cost per the per. It's the write down. Purple for purple. So it doesn't give any credit for that. Okay, thank you. And just one more follow up for Jim. Is, is, you know, the cost for modification is different than the cost for foreclosure avoided, which is an estimate of the number of foreclosures. And the number yeah. of foreclosures will change over time depending on what occurs. If all of a sudden there's a spike in foreclosures, that cost goes down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was just curious, following up on the uh, question from the gentleman at the FDIC, uh, I know there's probably a small thing that guys probably can do that variation that sort of thing that might not be a specific question. Are there any thoughts of perhaps examining what it was? You're absolutely right. There's a small sample, but the number of I, I'm going to need to extend the data uh, going forward because up to that point we had relative to uh, actual principal forgiveness uh, in this um, bit. But uh, and I'm not sure these are the data that would help us get a question of whether um, sort of share appreciation uh, loan become safe for the investor uh, or forgiveness principal or other um, aspects would be helpful. I'm not sure how I would approach that these data. Lauren, um, what, Lauren? Lauren, I'm with the CFPB. And Matt, you um, identified a couple 
uh, indicators of default after modification, and you know, no surprises in the rooms by a lot. And while that certainly is intuitive of the little vital score, my question is the thought that people's vital scores have already been pretty severely impacted by the time they got a month. So, so to be clear, I'm using the FICO score as origination. Uh, I don't have an updated FICO score for the borrower. Uh, yeah. One more question. We'll take one last question on the back end over here. Alejandro Becerra, I'm with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, the uh, census just came up with its latest uh, uh, home ownership data, and it shows, of course, the lowest rate of home ownership in several decades. But it particularly shows that, as of right now, there are 80,000 80, fewer white home house, uh, homeowners in the country than there were in the mid-2000s. So as we look back, it was only until about 2012 that the administration began to focus on principal reduction. And Sheila Baer, as early as 2008, called for streamlined loan modifications. So my question is, if there had been more effective loan modifications, including principal reductions, would the effects that we are now continuing to see be as dire? So I'll just uh, say, I think what we have from pretty much every study that's been done on this is effective modification. Um, now that said, you know, we have to be able to get down to the drilling point. Nothing is going to make, help you make that payment. I mean, both you know, maybe forbearance, maybe other strategies you can think about. But these sort of uh, mortgage modifications are not necessarily strategies. If you're unemployed, you're smart. Also, unemployed if you have your, your hours. Uh, so um, I think it would be very Whatever the particular modification parameter uh, can help. If you make the home affordable, people who have the means before that means look at it. One more question in the back, and then we'll cut it off. Uh, just a uh, my limit can be by talking to the second inspector. I'm sorry I didn't see your name. But can you elaborate a little more than you say that? I mean, I agree with you. Uh, I'm not opposing the statement you gave. Uh, in Pakistan, if we have people buy the house that they have whole cash, there is very little this market system. And if I'm a financier, a bank, and you buy a house with zero uh, down payment and tell other people that they're very, being very proud that you own a house, I will laugh at you that, you know, you pay just a couple of mortgage and you know you are telling people you own a house. This is like a fraud, uh, you know, delusional thing. <laughs> I think in the context of Indian Pakistani culture, so I mean, can you elaborate a little bit? I, I'm convinced of your uh, statement by like this one. It, my question is, I can't come giving you company. Thanks. Thank you. I, I mean, I don't think there's a lot more to, uh, to sound upon at the moment. I know we're out of time. But, but uh, I mean, it's certainly the case that in the US we have uh, a lot of programs that are designed to promote home ownership, uh, more than existing interest production, for instance. Uh, but we're really not special when it comes to our rates of home ownership, even in the context of you know offering extremely low down payments. I think you know thinking thinking more about the international comparisons and thinking about uh, you know what what's the safest system and one that also gives people access. And so you could imagine a system where uh, we have only technically require all cash for for, uh, for buying a house, uh, and you see a much lower home ownership rate than we have. At the moment, so I think there are certainly trade offs, uh, and there are certain health elements that introduce more or less risk uh, into the financial system accordingly. So that's I think, probably a discussion for another day. Well, thank you. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks for all of you um, for coming, and thanks for those in the webcast audience. Um, our next data talk is going to be October 6th, and um, our data demand and graphics um, symposium co hosted um, for logic on November 20th. Please be on the lookout for an invitation um, or check 
or check out our event page for more information. So with that, thank you all very much for coming and we look forward to